going once one here good morning good afternoon good evening folks uh thank you for joining this um combined uh a year-end virtual event uh, bringing together uh, various meetups and communities such as large-scale scrum uh product management business agility um and others we have a special guest today and i would like to um, introduce him um his name is david snowden um, and he's a very well-known person um, in the world of uh, organizational agility adaptiveness uh, he's a scientist he's a he's a professor he's a phd uh he shares his uh, work uh equally between um and being a chief scientific officer of the cognitive edge as well as being the founder and director of the center of applied complexity at the university of wales he is an internationally known name has traveled the world has presented spoken and has done work in various industries uh, addressing different um, organizational dilemma and issues uh, his uh, primary focus also uh, with uh, international and governmental structures, complex issues relating to strategy, organizational design, decision making. Uh, this is where he really focused his work. It's not the first time that David um, treats us with his presence. We have him. Uh, we have uh, had him in the past speaking on various uh, topics, and I will be sharing those as well along with the recording of this session. Uh, so, if you want to replay it or have any colleagues or um you know friends in the network that missed it you may point it to them uh you may point them to to, to the recording um i don't want to take any much uh, any more time from from this uh, session please keep your mics off uh, and ask questions uh, if you want to ask a question either raise a hand or just unmute yourself and respectfully ask also use a chat room which i will try to do my best to monitor and i think david also keeps his eye on the chat room uh, without any further ado, Dave, I would like to pass the word on to you and uh, please take it away. Okay, so I think the idea is I give a brief overview and then we can dive deeper as we want to. I should do a correction up front, by the way, Gene, and I'll do this by way of a story. Please do. Uh, Gary Klein, um, who you may know from Sources of Power, he's along with me, one of the five different schools of sense making. And I put a link up to the the source which identifies those. He and I were both giving a lecture in Singapore once together. So we had about 2,000 Singapore civil servants in the hall. And somebody said to us, which is quite nice, both of you have done genuinely original work in decision science. To what do you attribute your success? And we weren't sure which of us was asked first, to be honest. So we both answered simultaneously, we didn't do PhDs. And there was this stunned silence in the hall as a result of that, right? So this is my correction to you. Oh, okay, you don't have one. <laughs> I said, if we'd ever done a PhD, we'd have been brain reamed into the existing orthodoxy. We'd have spent six or seven years doing things which we actually now know are wrong. And therefore the originality came from sort of sitting on the edge of the communities, to be honest, all right? I'm, I may do it by book at a German university next year. I'm thinking about that. But uh, now I've got a master's degree. I can call myself professor in the European sense, not the American sense of the word. Yeah, but I haven't got a doctorate. Yeah. So right. the name of the field I work in is called naturalizing sense making. Um, it's one of five established schools of sense making. The dominant one is probably Carl Weick. Um, Weick takes a sort of more traditional sociological approach so we'll go and study what companies dads do and from that he'll derive general conclusions that's a sort of classic approach in social science um you've got gary klein who i just mentioned he did the pioneering work on how people make decisions based on patterns um that's more than my more traditional cognitive type experimental type work with decision makers that's where he comes from uh you've got brenda dervin who comes from library science and from postmodernism and from narrative work. The three of us all know each other and get on reasonably well, by the way. Um, Carl Weick will never come out and play. Every time we invite him to a debate, um, he goes quiet on us. And then there's a whole body of people in IT. So those are different schools of sense making. Um, I use sense making with a hyphen because I want people to see it as a verb, not a noun. 
And I define sense making as how can we make sense of the world so that we can act in it. And with that comes the concept of sufficiency is I never know everything I need to know in order to make a decision. But what sort of decision can I make based on what I do know and how I know it? So that's the kind of like principle. You know, it, it's all about contingency and sufficiency in sense making. And the naturalizing comes from philosophy. And that means to root what you do in the natural sciences, not in the social sciences. My background degree, by the way, is physics and philosophy. Um, that engendered a physicist despair of social science. They never have enough data to form any valid conclusion anyway, and I haven't changed my mind on that ever since. Um, and for, don't, you don't want to know what philosophers think about social scientists. I need a few drinks before I, I communicate that one. Um, you actually see that come through in some of the things I'm going to talk about because we're looking at a different way of actually doing organizational design and also inquiries. So what we do is we start with what we know from natural science, which has been subject to peer review, repeated experiments, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, that cuts out nearly all of psychology because all of the classic psychology experiments haven't been able to be replicated when people tried to do it. And I can come into the reasons for that later. So we start with cognitive neuroscience, with complexity science, with material engagement theory. There's a whole body of science and humanities that we draw on. And we use that as what's called an enabling constraint. So let me give you two illustrations of that and then come on to complexity. So one is a famous one. If you give a batch of radiologists um, X-rays, ask them to look for anomalies on the X-ray, and on the final x-ray, you put a picture of a gorilla, which is 48 times the size of a cancer nodule, then 83% of radiologists will not see it, even though their eyes physically scan it. Now, this is called inattentional blindness. Um, and what's fascinating is the 17% who do see it come to believe they were wrong when they talk with the 83% who didn't. So that's going to give rise to a phrase I'm going to use a lot, which is how do we find the 17% before they talk to the 83%. Now, I say that's called inattentional blindness. Klein, myself, and others now argue there's no such thing as a cognitive bias. They're actually all cognitive heuristics. If you look at the various cognitive biases, they've all evolved because at a species level, they reduce the energy cost of making decisions. So they're part of what our evolutionary history is. Yeah. So we're not going to get rid of them. We have to work with them rather than try and pretend we can get rid of them. And inattentional blindness is one of those. The reason for it, by the way, is the most you scan of available data before you make a decision is between three and 5%. And that's if you're really focused. If you're Chinese, it doubles. There are various evolutionary reasons for that to do with the nature of language. But for most people on this audience, three to 5%. That then triggers a series of memories and the memories are cognitive, physical, and social. Um, I'll attack mental models later because it's the wrong way of conceiving the problem. The reality is consciousness is a distributed function of the brain, the body, and its social environment. So that triggers a series of memories. And actually, the stories we hear in our communities are really important memory devices. This is Andy Clark's work on extended consciousness. And we grab those as fragmented patterns and we blend them together. It's called conceptual blending, if you go to the literature. And the first blended pattern, which fits, we apply. So we do a first fit pattern match, not a best fit pattern match. And in evolutionary terms, you can see the advantage of that. If you think about the early hominoids on the savannas of Africa, something large and yellow with very sharp teeth runs towards you at high speed. Do you want to artistically scan all available data, look up a catalog of the flora and fauna of the African veldt, and having identified lion, look at best practice case studies and how to avoid lions? You know, by that time, the only document of any use to you would be the book of Jonah from the Old Testament, which is the only example I've found of an escape manual from the digestive tract of a large carnivore written by a survivor. So we evolved to make decisions very, very quickly based on a partial scan, partial data scan privilege in our most recent individual and social experience. And that's how we all make decisions. So once we know that, we need to work with it. There's a slight sidebar on this, by the way. IT people are more likely to see the gorilla than non-IT people. That's because IT people tend towards the autistic end of the spectrum, so they scan more data. 
So one of the dangers we have is people design, people who are designing IT systems actually are cognitively diverse from their, most of their users with some of the consequences. So I'll just put that on one side if anybody wants to pick it up later. We're doing now work to pair dyslectics with people with Asperger syndrome because that actually introduces the right sort of cognitive diversity into teams. So we can work with these things. We don't have to pretend they're deficiencies. They're part of the diversity which human evolution has thrown out. So given that we know people will not make decisions based on a rational, you know, the, the classic enlightenment approach to decision making, and you see this in politics as well, is that if you give people the right information, they have the right education, the right competences, the right training, then they will always make a rational decision, is actually complete and utter nonsense. It will never happen. Yeah, it's not the way things happen. So we have to develop methods and tools which work with that feature rather than working against it. So to give an illustration, this is what is called a human sensor network in the European Union field guide to managing on complexity. I've given you the link there. I was the prime author on that. It says you should use your whole of your employees as a, work, as a sensor net mechanism. So faced with a situation, we present the situation to the whole workforce. We get them all to interpret it. We use a concept called high abstraction metadata, which means people can't gain the response, you know, which is actually more like play. And then from that, we can draw contour maps. So I'm in the hills at the moment, so maps are on my mind, all right? Um, contour maps show dense patterns, weak patterns, you know? And it actually identifies outlier groups like the 17%. So I need to use a very culturally experiential diverse network of people to assess the situation so that the 17% who've seen a gorilla are visible to senior decision makers before they talk to anybody else. But I can also see the dominant and minority patterns within the group. We do something similar on culture mapping and everything else. Now that's using the science as an enabling constraint in complexity terms. So we say that's the nature of human decision making. So let's develop tools and techniques which are compatible with that. And if you think about it, that's very like physics. Physics starts with theoretical physics. So we work out in theory what's possible. Then the experimental guys, who those of us who are on the theoretical side, always regard as boring people anyway, but we shouldn't, yeah, are there to actually test the ideas out and see what works or doesn't work. So our approach to all of our methods and tools, and we have a huge amount, most of them in the open source wiki now, is to go with what the theory says about a problem and then actually do practice in accordance with that theory and then modify the practice as we get more experience. And that takes about three to four years. Anybody who throws a method together in less than three to four years is a snake oil salesman, to be honest. Yeah? It takes that long to get the things right and to make sure they're consistent. And that's even when we've got a good starting point. And I'll go through a couple of them on organizational design in a minute. So that's one key fact. Another one is that the human brain pays more attention to failure than it does to success. And if you look at traditional fairy stories worldwide, and I've studied these for 40 years now, um, they all tell stories of failure, not success. If you got your children one night and told them a story about how, you know, Dick and Jane stayed at home, did what mummy and daddy said, achieve the family KPIs, you know, and conform with the family mission statement, you wouldn't get very far, yeah? The reality is we tell them stories about, you know, everything went wrong, we went to the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, we saw, you know, we met evil witches, God knows what else. Um, we have a happy ending because we do want them to go to sleep at night, but we hold it off as long as possible because to be quite honest, we want to scare the little buggers rigid. And the reason is stories of our failure actually provide better learning than stories of success. And if you look at any modern organization, the stories told around the water coolers are the stories of failure, not the stories of success. We actually evolved as malicious gossips because it has evolutionary advantage. So we work with that. We don't try and work against it. Yeah, I've, I've always satirized um, appreciative inquiry, for example, the original Coop Rider stuff is brilliant, but then it gets industrialized into something which always reminds me of the final scene of Monty Python's Life of Brian, with them all swinging backwards and forwards on the crosses, singing, always look on the bright side of life. Yeah. The reality is people learn mainly through sharing stories of failure, not stories of success. 
you can force them into success as a therapeutic process, but it's not a sustainable knowledge process. If I look at the work we've done on safety, and for example, companies like Boeing, everybody will tell you the story of Fred who failed to strap on his safety harness, fell off the gantry, luckily onto one of his mates. His mate broke his leg, they both lived. Everybody knows that story. Nobody tells a story about how Fred clamped on his safety harness and didn't have any accidents, because it's not interesting. Yeah? The stories which spread naturally, which we learn most for, are stories of failure, not success. So we build worst practice systems rather than best practice systems. Now, again, I'm using science as a constraint here. I'm not talking about how I would like things to be, which most organizational change practitioners do all the time. It's kind of like, this is the ideal world. These are the ideal people. Yeah, we all need to be positive. We all need to be aligned. We actually say, well, that's not the reality of human evolution. So let's deal with things as they are, not as they should be. So let me throw out another things I'll challenge on that. Um, I said earlier on in the prelim that one of the worst phrases used these days is mindset. I mean, that there is such a thing as a mindset. I buy it. The trouble is the way it works in organizations now is we have this massive change program. You know, we put in SAFE, we put in an OD program. It didn't work. The reason is you guys didn't have the right mindset. You know, it, it's a blame factor. Yeah, the reality is the process actually creates the mindset. It's not the mindset which creates the process. It's the wrong way around. The other is that actually social interactions, the stories we hear, influence us far more than how our brains are actually formulated. This is the post-Cartesian model of consciousness. Consciousness is a distributed function of the mind, the body, and the social environment, which is also why mental models is the wrong way of looking at things. That came out of systems thinking, which is dominated by information science with Shannon Nashby. And that's when we all thought that human beings were limited capacity information processing devices, to quote a textbook in the UK for psychology. Yeah, the reality is that it's not like that. Yeah, we don't have mental models in our brain through which we filter data. Actually, the social models of our narrative landscapes are far more important than individual aspects. It's not in that space. It's the wrong way of describing the problem. So we now tend to talk about three things, and language matters because language helps you describe a problem properly. Instead of mental models and mindset, we talk about agency, affordance, and assemblage. So agency is who or what can actually act in the situation. If you haven't got agency, well, it's irrelevant anyway. Affordance is what affordances are provided by the company, by the environment, by the education of the society which you belong. And assemblages, this is a reference to Deleuze for people into the philosophy, are the, the structured patterns of narrative which define our own culture. And actually, narrative actually forms what are called attractor wells. You can see this in the last election with Trump, etc., it's not a rational issue. What actually happens is what Trump was brilliant at, and I had to read his tweets every morning for four years, which was for a project I was doing with MIT. I then suffered withdrawal symptoms when he got banned. It was withdrawal from righteous indignation, which tended to follow it. Right? But what he was brilliant at was key phrases which triggered an assemblage, a pattern of narratives that people couldn't escape. Yeah? And we know that those assemblage structures actually have material reality. This is the new materialism when we want to get in the philosophy. So understanding the patterns of narrative at the society level, a company level and elsewhere is critical. And just to throw some more science in it, the thing we now know from epigenetics is that culture inherits over two generations. And we know the mechanism. So I'll give you the, the classic case on this. If you take mice, yeah? Mice have a particular liking for a certain type of food. I've forgotten what it is offhand. And so this is cognitive neuroscience. So if you've got pet mice, I apologize for what's going to come. So you take these mice, you feed them the food they enjoy, and then you start to give them really nasty electric shocks to the point where they're scared shitless whenever they smell the food that they love. You then leave them alone, let them produce a one generation of children, then their children produce and generations. So now their grandchildren come in and then you show them the smell and they run like hell. Yeah. And it's it. What it, it's actually the alio structure around the RNA. We now know the mechanism by which culture inherits and we know the speed by which it happens. So it's a biological phenomenon, not a sociological phenomenon. And that has major implications 
by the way, for social policy. Eva Jablonka, who's brilliant on this, is now arguing that the, and she's got evidence for this, that the level of symbolism in the language we speak to our children influences our grandchildren's intelligence. Right? And she can show the biological mechanism for that. So there's a lot of things coming through on this, which basically say this enlightenment model of the rational, isolated individual, yeah, you know, uh, sort of pre-computer computer in some ways is the enlightenment model is just fundamentally flawed. In fact, these days we talk more about renaissance than enlightenment. I'm doing a lot of work at the moment, for example, with indigenous people in Australia. There's a whole set of webinars on this. Welsh meet Indigenous Australia, which you can look at. And there's knowledge they have of, I mean, I saw them do a coal burn in the bush, all right? They've they've lost you know, more knowledge than we've ever gained in terms of environmental background. Now, it's not that we want to go back to the past, but we want to respect the past and build it into a modern future. If you go back to Vico, who was an Italian philosopher at the time of the Enlightenment, who's actually a quite easy read in translation, he basically says, you guys have got some brilliant new ideas, but don't forget the value of the past. And that's the Renaissance for the Enlightenment concept. Yeah. Either way, then the third thing is complexity science. Um, complexity deals with systems which don't have material linear causality. So a complex adaptive system has dispositions and it's modulated and the modulators have propensities. Now I'll explain that language. So if you take a metaphor, Imagine you've got a set of electromagnets arranged around a flat surface, which, given there's some engineers here, has a high coefficient of resistance before anybody gets pedantic with me, right? The magnets can change in polarity and strength. Some I control, some are controlled by people I know, some I've got no idea whether they'd be controlled or not, but they're changing. And in the middle of the table, there are cast iron sort of discs like hockey pucks. Yeah, some which are standalone, some which are connected with elastic bands, some with chains. Now, if all of the magnets keep the same polarity and the same strength, the disks will form a stable pattern. If I change one of the magnets, I can predict what will happen to the disks. If I change two of the magnets, I can predict it. If I change three, I can no longer predict it. Now, the magnets are what we call modulators. So a complex, and the, the state of the di disks is a dispositional state. And of course, some magnets have propensities, repeating functions, others don't. So what we need to do is to map the modulators and get real-time feedback loop. Now, this should be obvious, but I'll explain it. Given that I can only control some of the modulators, if I can look down on the space and I can change my magnets in real time, I can influence evolution but I've got real-time feedback loop with direct control of modulators. And that's a new approach to organizational design. Map the modulators and then start to get real-time feedback loops through human sensor networks and start to do what's called micro-nudging. Now, there's a big difference between nudge and micro-nudge. So there's a meta study just being published of all the major papers on nudge theory from behavioral economics which is basically shown it had zero effect, which doesn't surprise a lot of us who started looking at it from the early days. Yeah? Uh, we look at micro nudges, not macro nudges, which are mostly manipulation. So if I draw a story, for example, I'll give you an example on this because it's easier. We've been doing capture in hospitals now in Northern Ireland for 10 years. So we have a whole body of patient stories. Yeah, coming in every day, interpreted by the patients. If I go to nurses and say, how do you improve patient safety? They'll get defensive. If I say I need more patient stories like these and fewer patient stories like those, they can all engage. And this is a new theory of change. Yet more stories like this, fewer stories like those results in hyper-localized micro-interventions, which are sustainable in the community. But I monitor the whole system to see what actually emerges. I stop trying to manipulate the system from on high. And again, that's taking a complexity approach. Um, sorry, I've got a minor nosebleed at the moment. So if I occasionally put my head back and sniff, that's the reason. Yeah? Um, cold weather. So in a complex adaptive system, we basically manage the present, not the future. 
So one of the big differences between complexity science and systems thinking, most systems thinking methods start by workshop, define what we'd like to be, close the gap. And that terrible word, you know, the minute somebody says they want you to think holistically, I tend to run a mile or, or get aggressive one or the other, right? Um, systems, complexity thinking starts in a different way. It says, where are we? Where can we go next? If you want a simple way of understanding this, it's called the Frozen 2 strategy. So if you haven't seen Frozen 2, the movie yet, you've now got a good excuse because Professor Snowden says it's a great complexity movie, so you don't need children or grandchildren to watch it, all right? Um, in the second Frozen movie, the real heroine of the of the series, who's the young, younger sister without the magic, is left in a state of despair where she thinks she's lost her older sister, she's lost a guide, she doesn't know what to do. So she thinks a wonderful song, subsequently made famous by a Ukrainian refugee, all I can do is do the next right thing. In complexity, that's called the adjacent possible, going back to Stu Kaufman's work. So in complexity, we start by describing where we are, we identify where we can go next, we go there and we look again. We don't have outcomes. And throw some science in it again, meta study of all studies on human motivation, Whenever people are working for explicit goals, it destroys intrinsic motivation. There's no evidence to contradict that. Yeah, and that's the problem, because where do we have the highest amount of outcome-based targets, health, education, social services, where we have the highest need for intrinsic motivation, health, education, social services. What we can do with this approach is we can measure direction and speed of travel for energy consumption. That's called a vector measure. And this is a big difference. We switch from outcome-based targets to vector measures. We switch from deciding what the endpoint is to be to nudging the system with a sense of direction. We start journeys with a sense of direction rather than having goals. That opens us, us up to novelty on the pathway as we start to explore it. And then the final thing, this is kind of like the latest um, bit of work we've done, which is taking off like wildfire at the moment. I think it's one of the simplest things I've ever created. One of the great things in the EU field guide is it says the only thing you can map in a complex system are the constraints. So the modulators are a type of constraint. So we have a typology of constraints, which breaks them into resilient, robust, elastic, permeable, rigid, etc. And it's a typology including one I'm quite proud of because it was my, one of my conceptions, which is a dark constraint. So that's a reference to dark matter in cosmology. I can see the impact of something, but I can't see what's stimulating the impact. Senior executives get that one pretty fast. So we map all of the constraints either in the workshop or we use software to gather them at mass. And then we place them onto a grid in the, which is the vertical dimension is the energy cost of change. The horizontal dimension is the time to change. I say we can automate that or it can be done in a workshop. That means the top right, top right corner of it is what's called the counterfactual space. Uh, this is a reference to constructor theory and quantum mechanics, by the way. That's where the core idea comes from. So that's where the energy cost of change will and or the time to change is such that realistically they're not going to change. So we start by defining that, and then we put monitors in place to check if the, you know, is downstream, if that starts to change, we need to know about it fast. So we put in monitors to check on that. We then check the bottom left of the grid because that's low energy cost of change, low time to change. If anything there has a high, high impact, we need to work on a containment strategy pretty fast in order to manage it. And basically what we've now done is we defined the operational space. So we identify those constraints as clusters. We identify which we want to maintain, which we want to amend, which we want to destroy. We do safe to fail experiments to create new constraints. And then we look at the system and say, what has the lowest energy cost that will win? This is now seen, by the way, as a new foresight technique. And we stop trying to predict the future. We map the energy gradients of the present and about to start to red and blue team this with your military, because seeing the energy gradients from the enemy's point of view and our point of view, it's all about how we map the present. And then if you want to make a change, you say, well, if we change that constraint, it would be beneficial. So how do we reduce the energy cost of change? Or how do we reduce the time to change? 
then you go and do that and you see if you get a better result. Yeah. So you're constantly nudging the evolution of the system as a by effectively as an organic entity rather than trying to manage it by defining what it should look like and defining the qualities associated with it. Yeah. Um, which leads me probably into the final statement I'll make is part of the problem we got, and this really came out of systems thinking, but it's not exclusive to it, is that people associate emergent properties as causal. Well, the classic case on this is they see that people who are innovative are creative. So they run creativity programs to try and make people innovative. And that's just getting it asked about faith. The reality is innovation comes with starvation, pressure and perspective shift. And that makes you very creative. So you've got two emergent properties, but one is assumed to be causal on the other. And you see the same with leadership, competence maps and everything else. They all make that same fundamental error in terms of logic. Yeah. Uh, so a couple of things just to throw in at the end. Some of the new stuff we're working on. I've talked about human sensor networks. A big one we're working on is to build informal networks. You will never get rid of silos in organizations. People have been trying for 5,000 years without success, so maybe it's time to stop talking about it. The reason silos are important is they allow groups of people to have conversations at the right level of abstraction and codification rather than have to talk with everybody all of the time. So if I do a seminar with three or four complexity experts, we can get through in five minutes what would take two hours or even longer with a bigger group. That's why experts tend to organize in silos. Yeah. But one of the ways we worked on that is we then bring people together, a method called entangled trios. So we increase the network density across the silos of informal networks. And actually, interesting, if you go back to COVID, people fell back to their informal networks, not the formal systems, because informal networks carry trust naturally with it. So the way we'll work on this, for example, is to define three roles from three different silos we'll get people working in small groups within those roles on a common problem, you know, which is a good problem-solving technique in its own right, by the way. But what we're really focused on is building networks between the silos. So we're focused on the channels through which knowledge can flow rather than trying to get the knowledge defined up front. And we're now using that for distributed decision-making. And that's the one I want to finish with. So many years ago, when I was a general manager, I was called in by the CEO and told I had to write the ISO 9001 manual. Uh, this is the quality control manual. And I said, why me? I mean, I normally break the rules. I'm normally in here because I'm in trouble. And he said, well, if you write it, there's a good chance other people might follow it. He said, if I give it to quality control, it will be a 15 volume manual, a three week training course, and I have to double the size of quality control to get us through the certificate. Um, which is quite pragmatic. And either way, I realized, you know, I had to do this. So I wrote a seven page manual. I was still coding them. So it was a series of do case statements. If this happens, we do this. If this happens, we do this. If this happens, we do this. If this happens, you can do this or this if you've got that this level of education or experience. For those familiar with Kinevin, that's clear and complicated. And I said, if anything else happens, we assemble these three people from these three roles they make a decision a minute. And that was before I knew about complexity theory. So I said, we can't define in advance what the right solution is, but we can force the right diversity into the decision-making process. And that got us through the audit. Uh, we also had a blacklist of general managers who couldn't be trusted to answer questions by quality control inspectors properly. And we were a secure site. So if a quality control inspector came on site, we held them up challenging their ID for 10 minutes so we could evacuate those general managers from the site. There was an emergency button to do that. And then nominated deputies would be available to answer the questions from the quality control inspectors. So we had a deeply pragmatic approach to this, all right, in terms of the way we work it. Now, we don't do the same. We do the same on safety. If these things happen, you follow the rules. If anything else happens, you assemble people from these backgrounds, whatever they say goes. Yeah. And we're now using that in social change and in organizational change, because instead of one person making a decision, a combination of roles makes a decision. We can algorithmically allocate people to those roles so it can't be gained. And we can put in 24 and 48 hour delays. So you record what you're going to do and see if any of the objects. Now, that's actually getting really exciting, both in military environments and also in commercial environments. 
because it allows you to move decision making to the front line, but not based on individuals, but based on combinations of roles with transparency and audibility. And I can go into that in more depth if people want. So I've tried to throw some big concepts in. I've tried to give you examples of methods and tools and approaches on each. I've spent almost 40 minutes, so I'll now open up for questions or arguments or whatever. Thank you very much, David. Folks, uh, the floor is open, so um, just unmute yourself, briefly ask a question, and uh, go back and mute so Dave can answer. Thank you. Hi, Dave. This is James Gaines. How are you doing? Happy holiday. Uh, just wanted to get your just generally how how could should we kind of follow up on some of these concepts that you put out? I'm very interested in the latter the latter one, the one around manipulating uh, uh, where the decision is made within an organization. So if you, I'll go on mute now and let you answer that. Okay, so all of our methods are open source. They're on Kenevin.io. And we're actually at the moment building facilitation kits around those and other people's methods. So I have a firm belief that you need multi-vendor, multi-method approaches, not a single vendor, single framework approach. Just come off, off a call where we've got um, the two major scrum environments building hexes into that kit. So you'll see that come through. So there are methods there that are defined in terms of training and everything else. That one's fairly easy to pick up. Yeah, um, we will provide mentoring services if people want. Um, I'd start into, we developed a class called Rewild in Agile, which has proved quite popular. And we're running out Rewild in leadership for the first time in Copenhagen in January. And that will be in that course. But to be quite honest, it's in the open source wiki, read up on it. If you need some help, get in touch. Yeah, that, that's where we do stuff. Uh, the EU field guide, by the way, is a really good handbook as well. Um, that that's, I mean, that was written during the height of COVID, so it lays out in a very structured way most of the methods and tools. Right, and that's also on the Kinevin.io site. Yeah, I put the, the link field. in earlier. You can download it a PDF okay. for free, or you can get a copy sent to you if you pay for the postage, which I'd recommend rather than print it off with a laser printer, yeah, which will cost you a lot of money in ink. Yeah. And I'm sorry, how, how do I get that? Uh, uh, I put the link in earlier. I'll repeat it now. Okay, if you thanks. go to that link, that, that allows you to download and get a manual copy sent to you. Right? Uh, if you check on our website and look at Hexi, you'll find we've already got facilitation packs um, complete for that uh, know, to make life yeah. easier. All references, Dave. I'll scrap. I'll scrap from the script, and I'll uh, make sure everyone okay. gets it. The, the two scrum. So we've got two things. We got Jeff's approach. We we did a deal with Ivor Jacobson and the Essence guys to take across a practice level what he's got. So he's got that from Jeff Sutherland. We've just reached an agreement with Dave. Um, so that gives us all of the methods and tools associated with Ken. So those will be two separate packs within the Hexi Kit coming out shortly. We got two Kanban packs and various other ones. Uh, the Canavian process basically says wicked problems is a marketing trick, and some wicked problems are ordered and some aren't. Right? Um, and I, I don't like wicked problems as a concept. Um, basically, what we say is look at the problem, and this is called the apparatic turn in the EU handbook. So. Faced with a crisis, faced with a difficult problem, the first thing you do is shift it into the central domain of Kinevin. You then identify what experts can resolve, let them resolve it. You identify where there are conflicts between experts, and we have a method called the trioptican for that. Anything which is complex, you test all the hypotheses using safe-to-fail experiments. And if you don't think you've got enough hypotheses or you think you've restricted the space, that's where we do a temporary move into chaos. So that's where we use mass sense this sort of distributed decision support identification of patterns. So that's kind of like, that's laid out as the apparatic turn in the field guide as a different approach. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, we got one person with their hand raised. Uh... Yep. Yep. Can I jump in if I may? Yep. Hi, Dave. I'm Christian from Switzerland. Um, 
Um, reference back to your statement that uh, you know we have to stop just assuming that people make the the right, sensible, prudent, logical decisions just based on being having the right information at hand. Um, can you say a word or two about the value of traditional KM concepts like knowledge sharing and stuff like that in uh, and to what extent can we say that um, that it still has a value and with which bounded applicability? Well, traditional KM actually was a glorified renaming of information management. I mean, Polanyi famously said, we always know more than we can say. And I added to that, we can always say more than we can write down. So part of the problem you've got is we can probably write down less than 10% of what we know. And most, most corporate systems work on stuff which is written down. It's also the problem with AI. It's working on written text. It doesn't handle abstraction, which is key for humans. Narrative carries what's called requisite ambiguity on it. Yeah. So, and there are some things where we know, for example, it takes two or three years of experience for your brain and your body to evolve that you can know something. So the fundamental problem with traditional KM is it's not KM, it's 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 low-grade information management. Yeah. So you need to think about narrative databases. That's one of the things we've developed software for. Narrative actually is more ambiguous and therefore more adaptable. Um, for example, we did one with the US Army in Afghanistan. We said, company commanders, you don't need to write a patrol report if you keep narrative up to date continuously on patrol. And that came in in oral and visual form as well as written form or any combination. That's much better data than somebody writing something up at the end of the day. The other problem with traditional KM is it's always retrospective. And the way we remember things after the fact is very different from the way we remember at the time. Mm -hmm. So we talk about lessons learning and we have Gemba systems, which actually capture material as things go on. And we can now replace traditional reporting with that because it's more valuable data. Mm -hmm. So I, I think KM, I've seen KM go through five cycles of death and rebirth. And the reason it keeps going through the cycle is there's a need to manage knowledge, but the minute they take off, they codify the stuff into information, they create communities of practice, and then, of course, that doesn't work, so they die, then a year or so later, the whole thing starts up again. Can we not say that there is, that there is a certain space within the clear domain where capturing certain things has value as an anchoring? Oh, yeah. In the complex as well. I mean, I write articles, I write blogs. I mean, writing things down, you know, it, it's it, it's codified, so it diffuses faster if you go back to Barso. There's nothing wrong with writing things down. There's everything wrong in thinking you can capture everything which is known in what people write down. Yeah, so you are, you need all of these in all the Kinevin domains, but you need them in different proportions in different contexts. Mm -hmm. And we underestimate the importance of narrative. Now, going back to your to the original statement, um, this situational awareness mm. of having people be exposed to the information, even though we know that doesn't necessarily mean where they're going to make the logical decision, does it increase the prob probability that the decision that they're going to make is going to be it sensible? It increases the probability that the decision maker will make a better decision. So what we do is we present the current situation as we understand it to the whole of the workforce. They all interpret it in high abstraction metadata. And then we show the maps of the different types of interpretation. So that breaks the pattern entrainment of sitting with a few executive advisors who feed you what you want to know. I originally designed that, by the way, for Admiral John Poindexter, who I worked for in DARPA days. Yeah. And he said when he was NSA, and I didn't know who he was until I liked him. And then it was too late to realize I wasn't meant to like him as a good world socialist, but never mind. Um, and he said when he was NSA, every time he asked for advice, the agencies competed to have their advice accepted, not to tell him what he needed to know. Because actually what matters is to be invited back to the table to continue to give advice. And you see that in large corporates as well. And I validated it since with one Democrat and two other Republican NSAs. Yeah. So one of the tasks he gave us, which we did, which is also the problem of abduction, is to allow him to go direct from an abstract representation of the space to the raw intelligence data without any interpretive layers. And that's what I've just talked about. It's the ability to do mass situational assessment and mass micro scenario generation. That's the way you break the cognitive bias of people not seeing gorillas because they don't expect to see them. 
Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. I have some more things, but I'll let people ask all the stuff and I'll come back around. Thanks. Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you very much. Anyone else, folks? Um, any other questions for Dave? Uh, Denise, I see you okay. raising your real hand, yeah. not virtual. Go ahead. Real hand. Can you go a little deeper on your thinking around um, the, where was it? The not being explicit in terms of the outcome because it i don't know i guess it probably squashes down creativity rather like how how do you think that and how do you frame that when you're in a change organization or trying to inspire change but the, the problem you've got is that if you're dealing with a complex adaptive system you can't know what the outcome is anyway it, it's a priori impossible so it's a great, it's a major mistake to define it. And what you get mm -hmm. is perverse incentives. So people focus on achieving the target rather than the thing the target is measured. This is also Strathan's variation on Goodhart's law. The minute a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a measure. So if you're dealing with something where there isn't material linear causality, which is a complex adaptive system, you can define the present, you can find the adjacent possibles, you can define a direction of travel, and you can measure that direction of travel with a vector measure. So we don't get rid of KPIs. We just make them appropriate to the system. Could I ask like a follow-up sim related question? Um, mm -hmm. Oh, someone else got their hand up. Sorry. I, I, I was going to ask about OKRs. Please go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was going to ask about OKRs and your view on them. With about what? Kind of setting a target. Um, you can set a target if you've got a highly ordered, highly constrained system. If you haven't, it's a waste of time. Sorry, this is this is one of one logic. All right, if you can't define, if there is no linear material causality, you can't define an outcome. Yeah, you just can't do it. You can define it, but people will then focus on the outcome achievement. And it may not actually produce what you want. So classic examples on this. You say that nobody should be in accident and emergency. Yeah, Everybody should see an accident and emergency within four hours of coming in. That but buggers up the triage system. You know, it's a good target, but then people are admitted, you know, are seen before people with chronic illness because the triage system, the thing the hospital is measured on, is, is looking entirely at that. Yeah, and it's called perverse incentives. Yeah. So again, you need to measure things, but you need to allow local adaptability in the field. Yeah, If I measure nurses, for example, on the way the pair, patients index their stories, I can measure their performance, but I can reward nurses who provide empathetic care. I got a stand innovation at the Welsh Nurses Conference because I said, you guys are forced to break the safety rules three or four times a day in order to provide empathetic care to patients. Because people are devising the targets and the rules on the assumption that a study of the past is objective and that everything fits within a normal distribution. When actually the study of the past is not objective and it's a Pareto distribution. Therefore, we end up with people being forced to do things which make them highly vulnerable if something goes wrong, but they have to do them in order to provide empathetic care. So we need the measurement system to match, you know, the measurement system needs to match the system. Is that just a case of a lack of? collaboration and comms in setting those targets no it's actually it's a priori impossible for the targets to be set but that is the classic excuse but it's been going on for years all right and we get targets on targets on targets you get more and more money being spent on target compliance if you look in the aid community at the moment you have to put 20 percent of your budget to managing the measurement system rather than doing the thing you're meant to do it's just it's just perverse <sighs> wrong type of control you'd never do it with your kids there's a very good lesson for a complex adaptive system would you do it with your children you wouldn't do it for your children don't do it with your employees follow up question to that real quick on the other side of the spe spectrum um what what would be your advice to orient ourselves to differentiate between platitudes and inspirational goals? 
Um, I've yet to see an inspiration goal which didn't become a platitude. Uh, we, we give a sense of direction in two ways. One is we give people clusters of stories, but we generally agree on what we don't want to be, not what we do want to be. It's far more inspirational. You can get consensus very quickly on we don't want to be this type of organization. We don't want these sort of stories. That leaves open possibilities. That's how fairy stories work. We don't inspire people. We teach them what we don't want. Yeah. So I would reverse it. Right? And I say, I've yet to see any, any inspirational statement which didn't end up, as a, end up as a platitude. And we had value statements, mission statements, purpose statements. We're now about to have deep purpose statements, God help us. And it's just a consultancy treadmill of putting words that nobody can disagree with on the flip chart and you know, descending like Moses from the mountain with the tablets and wondering why people are doing something else instead. Hey Dave, quick question. Uh, quick uh, a point. I would like to point you at Mar Margarita. She has a hand raised. Yeah, I was, uh, I was going to wait, wait, say when you're going to let her in. She's very patient. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I'm interested in the concept you mentioned of nudges and micro nudges. I've been yep. exploring it lately uh, from the co organizational co culture perspective and find it quite easy to think about it from the space and architecture side, but on the behavioral part and leadership styles, I find it quite quite challenging. Yeah, there's a, there's a really good book called Neoliberalism, uh, Neuroliberalism, sorry, by colleagues of mine at Aberystwyth University which basically says behavioral science has been taken over by, by neoliberalism economics. It's a manipulative technique. Micro nudges, so let's take the example. So I've got patient stories and nurses stories coming in continuously. We've just done this in the Netherlands in old people's homes. Yeah? So we've had continuous narrative capture of residents, medical staff and relatives. It was originally designed to supplement the transaction systems actually it's flipped the transaction systems now feed the narrative systems because they're more valuable yeah um, because narrative provides much richer context to care than than rigid structures yeah so we can then look at that and we can say look we need more stories like these and fewer stories like those and we can measure that because we're capturing that man narrative continuously in quant format not qual format you've got to be quant you can't be qual and therefore, we can measure whether you have got more stories like those or fewer stories like those. And that's called a vector measure. But if you ask more stories like this, fewer stories like that, everybody can come up with ideas, all of which are micro -nudges. So I'll give you another example. When we did in South Wales, so this is an industrial area, you've now got five generations of some families who haven't seen a job. They've been on welfare for that period, all right, with all the consequences for that. It used to be a mining area. Um, so what we did is we used children as ethnographers to capture stories from the environment. We didn't send anybody from outside. We used school children, much more effective. Yeah, they know the people, they can ask questions, they got the story. We then drew the, the story map from that, like a contour map. And the minister, the politician said, well, I would like more like this and fewer like that. We'll fund anything which comes up. And then we all we used entangled trios. So we used young teenager with person from their grandparents' generation with person from local government. And we set those trios on the problems. They came up with about 100 micro initiatives rather than a grand plan or a grand strategy. Yeah? And that's far more effective yeah, in terms of the way it works. For those of you in software development, by the way, we use the same technique for requirements capture. So a young programmer with systems analysts with user trained to talk to IT people. It's much easier to train users to talk to IT people than train IT people to understand users. And we'll throw 15 trios at a problem for a month and see what they come up with rather than send out a systems analyst. We get better data. But those are micro nudges, micro changes. Thank you. Okay, I appreciate that example. Thank you for the question, Margarita. Folks, uh, we got about four minutes remaining, and um, I would I think we may we may need to take another quick question too. So uh let's uh let's time box it and uh Michael, Michael, there we yes, hello. Hello. Uh, hello. <laughs> uh, I had two questions, and you can ask you can answer either one of them or both of them. Uh, the first one, uh, you mentioned trios a few times. Uh, why trios? 
Uh, and the second one, talking about trios, you talk, talked about uh, sense making. You said you have a view, a uh, client has a view, and Vike has a view. I, I, I started uh, getting interested in sense making with, with Vike, but I, I noticed that you said, well, he never responded or something. Do you, do you think there's a, a trio in there or, or not? Okay, so the reason you have a trio, I mean, originally did this in the 70s on peace and conflict studies in Northern Ireland. So I, I was then going to be a Jesuit. So I was sort of in the sort of religious camp. Yeah. And we had two approaches to peace and reconciliation. Um, one was to get everybody together in a big hall and have a long discussion. This was um, Corrie Miller about you know why Catholics and Protestants should get on. We have more in common than we have in difference. We should stop throwing petrol bombs at each other. Um, and it worked in the workshop and they reported huge success, but nothing changed. So people were throwing petrol bombs at, at each other again within a week or so. It was wonderfully satirized recently in um, a comedy program called Derry Girls. So I've given you the excerpt from that. It's where the Protestant boys are forced into a peace and reconciliation process with the Catholic girls managed by a trendy priest watched over by a cynical nun and a cynical Protestant teacher is very, very funny. We took a different approach. We took two or three people in different combinations from each communities. We dumped them into Latin America for six months. Mm. And they suddenly discovered they had more in common than they thought. And they had a conversation about their differences when they were ready to have it. Now we're building that as a big process with GMU, with the Carter Center yeah, in Washington. That's one of the reasons I was over as a different approach to peace and reconciliation. The reason is in groups of up to five, people from radically different backgrounds can have a conversation. The minute you go above five and three is a safer number, they form into their factions and they defend their positions. Yeah. So three allows, three is kind of like, you know, one is arrogant, two is a conflict, three is a consensus. And Dave, just to clarify, oh, sorry, that was answering question. that was answering why trios. Uh, that was answering why trios. Um, I think, I mean, Brenda, Dave, and myself, and Gary keep inviting Vike to have a discussion, but I think he he's got everything to lose and nothing to gain. Yeah, the schools are different. He's the he's the granddaddy of all of this sort of stuff. By the way, Reed Vike is brilliant. Vike with Sutcliffe is terrible. All right. Well. Um. Thank you. Thank you. So Dave, thank you for this. Uh, so folks, uh, Dave, we're actually out of time and I want to be very conscious of your time uh, specifically. Um, I would like to, unless there's a very pressing question, maybe just one and a short one that you're willing to answer, I would like to wrap this up. I will have a very short one if, if, please if Dave do. allows. V very short, please. Um, would you say that the concept, can we use the concept of mindset loosely to promote heuristics? Just to, to use more of a colloquial level? I, I would avoid the word, to be honest, because it's, it's, it's linked in with this De Descartian concept of consciousness. The mind and the body are separate. The fact is they're closely integrated. They're closely linked with social environments. So I think the, the mindset word and the mental models word, we really need to abandon. Um, I think Sengi got it complete. I mean, I reread Learning Organization the other day. That is a disastrous book. I can see why it was popular, but it assumes limit. Li, you know, concept of systems thinking is an early form of systems dynamics, which even Forrester condemned. It brings in the mental models concept. It's actually pseudo religious in its objective. Yet we need something which is far more objective. And most of the people I know in systems thinking, in cybernetics, and yeah are appalled when you associate the ideas with, with singing yeah so I, I would just get rid of the word it's it, it's the, the way you describe things frames the way people approach them heidegger famously said man thinks he's the master of language language is the master of man yeah i understand thank, thank you. you thank you thank you uh dave and this note i really would like to wrap this up primarily for your own benefit just so you can have your time back I really want to thank you personally for doing this. Yeah, pleasure. Uh, it's uh, it was uh, on a rather short notice, and uh, I do appreciate your um, your time and your effort, and 
mostly uh, first and foremost your great contribution to the world of learning so um that's certainly not unnoticed and uh so thank you very much and thank you everyone uh for joining attending and uh raising questions listening and also taking this further to your colleagues and network wherever uh we will be uh, uh trying to make uh, this recording available very soon uh, I just need to do a little bit of uh, back backstage work. Um, if we do things right, hopefully in 2023, Dave, maybe you can uh, have another appearance and maybe sure. we'll come come up with another great topic. We had a full room today and uh, I'm sure we'll do uh, just as good in the future. So I want to thank yes. you uh, personally once again and everyone who attended and wish you all a happy, healthy um, new year and the holiday season and um, to all parts of the globe. There are, you know, dealing with that unrest, uh, lots of peace and and um, and and prosperity and happiness very soon to come. Read between the lines. Thank you very much once again, folks. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, you, Thank you very Merry much. Merry Christmas, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. Talk to you soon. Cheers. Yeah, I'll unmute now, Gene. Thank you so much for putting this on. This was great. Yeah. Um, you know, this is a this is a great capstone for the year, my friend. So thank you for putting this on. You bet. Yeah. Thank I'll, you. I was Cheers. just putting it in the chat. A lot of things to like uh, think about and.